Thank you very much for joining us this morning, sir. And ladies and gentlemen, please have your seats and let's get down to the business of our agenda this morning. The premise has been set for us, <clears throat> Your Excellencies. What we want to do is really to focus on bankable projects. In, in the audience this morning, uh, you have people who are doing business on the continent and also those, well, you may call them the uninitiated, people who still nurse uh, questions about how safe it is to do business on the continent and where to look. And practical questions are being asked. How do I start? Who do I talk to? Where do I put my money? And what are the dividends on my, or what will be the dividends on my investment? Uh, and so these are some of the areas that we'll be looking at this morning over the next one hour. Um, but there's an elephant in the room. It's, it's the issue of Ebola and um, <coughs> the impact it's had so far uh, in parts of West Africa. And we cannot start this conversation um, by, you know, by not talking about, about that. Mr. Um, Museveni, based on your own experience containing Ebola in, in Uganda, immediately, uh, are there any lessons, are, are there specific action uh, points that you need to be taken by African leaders, by West African leaders, to deal with this current situation? Well, as uh, President Mah Mahama said, we are veterans of defeating uh, Ebola. It has broken out three times. One time in Gulu. Gulu is northern Uganda. Another time in uh, Budubujo, near the border with Congo. Another time uh, in the center of the country, in uh, Chibari, Chibari district. <coughs> the, it, is, it is deadly. It kills uh, a big percentage of the people who get sick, although a percentage also survive uh, Ebola. But the crucial point about Ebola is that although it is very infectious, fortunately it is not infectious by breathing. It's not like, <coughs> it is not as infectious as flu, for instance. Flu is more dangerous if it was not, uh, it, 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 it spreads faster because it goes through the air, through breathing. This one goes through only contact. Now, what you need to stop is the contact. And that's why I am not shaking any of your hands. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so that message is clear. We need to break the contact. Just, just hold on. <laughs> he refused to shake all of us this morning. <laughs> Contact, uh, there, there, is a, there is a, my medical people have not clarified for me. They say contact, when somebody has already started feeling the symptoms of sickness, that's what they say. It seems even if somebody is infected, but has not started exhibiting the symptoms, he may not be infectious. So I said now, that boundary, where is it? So, so that's why I said no shaking of hands. Right. Uh, so once you, you, you deal with the issue of contact, and that's where the, the leader, so, so the, the, the crucial point there is political leadership. Right. It's not just a medical problem, political leadership. So political leadership is needed right now. When you get something like that, what I normally do, I come out within six hours. The Director General of Medical Services will take, ring me even in the night, tell me there is a big problem. The following morning, I will be on the radio. Say, stop shaking of hands. Stop burying people who have uh, died in mysterious ways. Report to the health centers, uh, the health authorities. Uh, so once you deal with the contact, the, the, the customs, which Mr. Mahama is talking about, this uh, bathing dead bodies, and all that must stop. Was there is this, uh, this problem. Uh, then the next group to protect are the medical workers themselves. That's right. Uh, President Museveni, if, if you just bear with me, uh, yeah, you, yeah, you've yeah. made very valid points, but I want us to move just on. Just hold on, let me finish that before I forget. In, in a minute, sir? <laughs> just hold on. The, the medical workers, that's why he, he's making a point about 
the protective gear of the medical workers. Because if you don't do that, then you are in trouble. Thank you. Sorry to. <laughs> Thank you very much, sir. <laughs> uh, uh, President but, Kagami. But, but to answer the question <laughs> of whether you fellows you should come fear from uh, fear coming to Africa because of Ebola, don't fear. Once we know how to control, to control it, it is easy to control. It is actually the easiest to control. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you very much, <laughs> President Museveni. President Museveni, uh, ahead of oil production in 2017, you have seen, your country has seen a, a rush of foreign investment in, into the power and uh, then transport and the hospitality sectors. Uh, and that is really fueling demand for new infrastructure. Again, we're talking about roads. But for you, which sectors do you see as a priority in Uganda's development that they should be addressing their minds to? Well, before I talk about uh, specific sectors, business has got two kings. One king is market, the buyer, the one who buys what you produce. Because if you produce and nobody buys, you will be bankrupt. <laughs> so that's one king. And we are telling you that Africa has got that king. Consumption in Africa is going up. We are one billion people, the whole of Africa. Our part is more than half a billion. So these are consumers. The middle class in Uganda is now 37% of the population and it is growing. So that's one side of business. If you are a business person, you, you need somebody to buy from you. Secondly, uh, the, the other king is the entrepreneur, the one who produces. So we, we, the consumer is there already. Now we want the, the, the second king, the entrepreneur. Then the, the, the two are linked by facilitating factors like infrastructure, roads. Roads are mainly done by the governments in our area, but there are also roads which can be done for toll, for toll roads. So you need a private sector to get involved? Yes. The railway, the power, that's to link the two kings, the, the, the consumer <laughs> and the entrepreneur, the, 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 the producer, the, the manufacturer or the service provider. <coughs> now, Africa, I think, uh, will be three billion people in the next, uh, not, not, not so far from, from now. Uh, it, is the, it is the place to be in. Now, we had a problem of infrastructure, which we are dealing with now. Infrastructure is crucial for, for these people because with good infrastructure, you lower costs of doing business and therefore you improve profitability. So from whichever angle you look at it, Africa is the place to be because the consumption, consumption, consuming power is there, uh, the infrastructure is being worked on, and thirdly, we have also negotiated markets with other big markets, market access with the United States, with the China, with India, with the, even Turkey, even with Japan, the only one we have not negotiated with the European Union, the only one we have not negotiated with are the, the Russians. I don't know why we have not uh, <laughs> negotiated with them. Uh, so that's why Africa is the right place to be. <laughs> and back to my, my initial question, what is your development priority? President Museveni, yes. So you've, you've talked about roads and you've talked about partnerships. Where immediately do you want to see heavy investment going? Where infrastructure is being done mainly by the government, but the, infra the private companies can also come in, in energy. The only problem I've seen with energy is that when the private companies come in, they use borrowed money. And that borrowed money has got high interest. And once they, they produce electricity, they try to recover money through high electricity prices uh, in, in order to pay back the other loans. Uh, and yet me, I want cheap electricity for my factories. 
to, to, to be competitive. So there, there is some sort of contradiction with the, with the private sector. I'm beginning not to like them <laughs> in the area of energy. So, so, so you do want them to get involved. No, no, no. But uh, the question then is, if, if you have an aversion for, for the sort of dividends or expectations they have <coughs> in that sort of arrangement, for the then what's their motivation? What's their incentive? The, the, to, add, to solve that issue of uh, high ele electricity prices, because when we build a dam in Uganda, the price of the electricity is three cents per unit. A government dam. Yes. A hydropower dam built by the government. The price of electricity is three cents per unit. When it is built by the private people, because they are trying to pay the other expensive loans, which they got from banks, they go up to 11 cents per unit. And yet, and yet I want cheap electricity for my factories. But that's how I will be competitive in terms of production. So I was discussing with one clever European man. <laughs> well, there are many others, but... Uh, <laughs> I, I, I happened to read that one. <laughs> this man was saying that maybe you could use uh, this aid money, because the Europeans say they are aiding us, although we are the ones who are aiding them, <laughs> which is another topic. But this man was saying maybe aid money could be used to subsidize private uh, electricity producers so that they charge low electricity prices. Because th th this is definitely going to make me give up private people in the electricity field. Mm -hmm. For the toll roads, I have no problem. Somebody can build a toll road and the rich people can use it <laughs> and pay. As long as I've got another smaller road, for my poor people <laughs> who can't pay. I have no problem with the toll road uh, being done by the private sector. <laughs> but the electricity, we welcome private capital, but there's that issue of the price at the end, uh, which, which should be, should be looked How do you at. propose that you can get around that hurdle with them? Mm. How are you gonna go about it? Because- uh, One idea is that one of aid money being, uh, being twin, twinned up with the private investment to build the dam, but charge low price, uh, low price for electricity, so that they, they, they are supported by the aid money which the Western governments have been giving. Mm. That's one idea. Uh, President Museveni, <clears throat> are you able to provide us with an, an update, as, as briefly as you can, on, on the oil refinery project that you're working on in, in Uganda and what impact you're expecting this will have on investment in, in your country. Yeah, but before I do that, the, <coughs> what uh, these uh, gentlemen and ladies should know is that the African economies have been growing at high rates, 6%, 7%, some of them 9%, some of them even 10%, in spite of the bottlenecks, in spite of lack of electricity or inadequate electricity, in spite of uh, poor road transport, these economies have been growing at very high rates. So you can imagine what will happen if we solve the bottlenecks as we are doing now. I thought I should mention that. Now, you are literally $100 million, <laughs> which you are talking about. For a start. Uh, is just a, a joke, because the, the, the demands are so much. That literally $100 million of yours, it, it may help me to build uh, some more, uh, because now I have a problem of producing a lot of maize, which I export and processed. I have a lot of fruits which are not processed. I have a lot of agro-processing. We just consume that little... <laughs> <laughs> not even enough. 
100 million dollars of yours. <laughs> but coming to the, to, to, to the other question of the refinery, yes, we have, uh, we have agreed with the oil companies. Because the oil companies were trying to lecture me that I did not, we did not need an oil refinery. <clears throat> now, I happened to visit Iran. Iran is a country which is not popular here. <laughs> but, but me, I, I go to all those places. I, I come to, to, to England. From there, I go to other places also. <laughs> now, when I went to Iran, I asked the president there. I said, Pre President, you produce oil. Do you have refineries here? <clears throat> he told me, and this was the other one, the one you didn't like most here in the West. <laughs> The, the, the former one, the one who was there before. Ahmed Ahmed He said, we have nine oil refineries and we are building another seven. Now, here I was being lectured that I should not have even one. So, but eventually, it was resolved. Uh, and they thought that I didn't know much about economics. Because the problem we have in Uganda is that we are landlocked. So when you bring oil from outside, my neighbors, who are Muslims and Christians and so on, they knock off some money for transporting oil through their territory. Uh, so what, I was, what was going to happen if we did not have an oil refinery would be that our crude would pay tax, transit tax going out, and, uh, and the refined products would pay transit uh, tax coming in. So I said, look here. <laughs> Even my, uh, my late old mother knew some economics. <laughs> <laughs> to see that this is, uh, uh, is not correct. <laughs> so we have now agreed on the oil refinery. <coughs> We have also agreed on the, the crude that should go in the pipeline. Uh, so I think we are moving very well now. We, we are now very friendly with the oil companies. <laughs> we, are, we have also agreed on the gas. We shall never flare our gas. Gas is not for flaring. Gas is for, for producing power. Gas is for helping us to process our iron ore into steel. So we have agreed on all those uh, points which had made oil a curse in some, in some other situations. This oil of Uganda would not be a curse. It, would, it is a blessing. I'm going to have to wrap up very shortly because we are very much uh, pressed for time. Uh, but, but President Mahama, um, again, challenges of the Ghanaian economy. <coughs> you are currently in, in talks with the International Monetary Fund. Uh, let's cut to the chase. What do you want from the IMF? What are your expectations? What will be the implications? What should investors be thinking about as they observe these conversations, this discussion with the IMF proceed? I think that um, <clears throat> two have evolved. I mean, Ghana is not the kind of country it was when we first went to the IMF in the 80s. And um, I think the IMF is also not the same organization it used to be. Um, as President Kaunda, who said the IMF was like a madman, and whether you had malaria or a broken leg, they gave you kuni. I guess that <laughs> they've come a long way since then. And so we're looking to build a partnership that restores macroeconomic stability for us. That's, that's key because um, private investment, you know, wants to see that the macroeconomic environment is predictable and stable. So that's the, the first thing we're looking to do. But we're also looking to transform the structure of our economy to make it more robust so that we don't have to have the cyclical booms and busts depending on what happens to international commodities on the world market. The current uh, instability we're going through is partly because of um, the drop, uh, the collapse of cocoa prices and gold prices, and those are our key uh, exports. And so we suffered a loss of um, revenue of about $1.5 billion, you know, in a space of about one and a half years. And for an economy like ours, that is significant revenue. And so creating more pillars 
you know, on which our economy can stand is one of the things we're looking at, both in terms of opening up new sectors like the oil and gas sector, we're giving out more exploration licenses, and those are sectors better left to the private sector because they can leverage the investment to put in there, and so we're doing that. Energy and power, both uh, the state and private sector, are creating an environment where we all can invest. And of course, one of the major game changers for us is bringing onshore our own uh, natural gas uh, from the Jubilee field and the other fields that we've discovered. We've finished the processing plant and we're going through the process of tying it in to the FPSO in the Jubilee field. That should bring some 120 million standard cubic feet of gas for power generation, can produce about some 500 megawatts of power. And it's critical for us because of the fluctuation in the operation of the West African gas pipeline. We had a lot of excitement when the pipeline was built, hoping that the abundance of Nigerian gas would flow through the pipeline to help all the four countries that were signed onto the pipeline to be able to generate. But the volumes have been very disappointing. And so bringing on our own gas would ensure some more energy security for us. Now, as shortly we'll be breaking into the plenary sessions and some of your delegates and business leaders will be talking about the opportunities that exist. Uh, a minute for all of you uh, in wrapping up, uh, basically summaries. What do you want them to bear in mind as they go into that plenary session? And as you return to your countries, uh, what do you want to go away from here with it? Again, I'll start with you, President Kagame. Well, I very briefly say to the investors here in this room that uh, invest in Rwanda, in East Africa, your money will be safe, you will have high returns, and the countries and our citizens will benefit and will develop together. So everything is there, ready the areas to invest, the framework that is, uh, provides a conducive uh, uh, opportunities, and uh, you're most welcome. <clears throat> well, I'll just say that the taste of the pudding is in the eating, and why don't you take a, a look? Why don't you come to Africa and take a look? I mean, there's so many opportunities opening up. And just to say that Africa is not the same continent that uh, people perceived it to be. It's a continent that is taking its place in the world. I mean, there are more elections taking place, open you know, uh, uh, and, and vibrant media landscapes, uh, respect for the rule of law, human rights. And I think that a lot of the growth that we're seeing in Africa is a result of the democratic dividend that is beginning to pay off in all the countries uh, we have. Um, it's a continent that is made of 54 countries, and so often when you uh, ask me if I know your friend in Kenya, I probably wouldn't know him because <laughs> it's thousands, thousands of kilometers away from Ghana. But certainly, there's something good happening in Africa, and I think that you know, investors all over, all over the world must come and take a look. Mr. Museveni, a minute. Uh, come and invest in uh, agro-processing. If you don't want agro-processing in Uganda, that is, or in any other part of Africa, but I'm talking about Uganda. Agro-processing for my maize, I have a problem there. My fruits, my other foodstuffs. Uh, then invest in, in minerals, huge mineral potential, uh, iron ore, uh, nickel, adding value to them, apart from oil, uh, oil and gas. Uh, invest in infrastructure, uh, like some, uh, some of the roads and the power, if we, if we can solve the problem of price, <laughs> of electricity, uh, in services, everything is, is, is there. And uh, uh, the cost of production in Uganda are going down because we are dealing with, 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 with the infrastructure. So profitability. We, 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 for companies will definitely go up. I thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Honorable Mizengo Penda. Well, for, for, for Tanzania, <clears throat> of course, as part of East Africa, there are a lot of things that we share. But certainly one area that uh, I, I would seriously urge the investors to look at seriously and see the possibilities 
is in the agriculture. And to me, it's agri-processing business. And, and the reasons are obvious. You see, we, we are leading people who are still dependent on land and agriculture for their livelihood, but also development. So to me, that would be crucial, and probably number one. But as my elder brothers have said, agriculture cannot flourish if you don't have power. So we need also power and good enough. We have gas opportunities, we have coal opportunities in Tanzania, uh, geothermal opportunities in Tanzania. So it's an area that, uh, that we can welcome anybody to come and see what we can do. And finally, of course, it's the infrastructure generally. Railways, roads, ports. Uh, we, we, we have quite a big portfolio in this particular area where we can also welcome colleagues to come and see the possibilities. Right. So, welcome to Tanzania, peaceful country, full of attractions in tourism as well. And beautiful shorelines. And I'm beautiful gonna have to, shorelines. I'm going to have exactly. to pick up from here. So, so basically, yeah. your job is cut out. Many yeah. thanks. You've been a wonderful audience. Yeah. Uh, our panel has been uh, the Prime Minister of Tanzania, Mizingo Penda, uh, His Excellency Weri Kaguta Museveni, uh, of Uganda, His Excellency John Dramani Mahama of the Republic of Ghana, and His Excellency Paul Kagami, President of the Republic of Rwanda. Uh, many thanks for being a part of this conversation. <laughs>